Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tomabu Ajobime. I am a immunologist and uh, president of the Benin Immunology Society, a member society of the International Union of Immunology Societies. I will be moderating our discussions today. We have more than 100 uh, participants and we want this webinar to be interactive, so feel free to ask questions in the Q&A. We will try to address all questions um, with our speaker. Our speaker today is Dr. Shane Patrick Proti, and his talk will focus on adaptive immunity and immune memory to SARS-CoV-2 after COVID-19. Shane Proti is a virologist and professor in the Vaccine Discovery Division of La Jolla Institute of Immunology in California. Initially trained in molecular virology and then in viral immunology, Crotus Lab focuses on both the basic immunology of T follicular helpful cells, viral immunology, including SARS-CoV-2, B cell immunodominance and the central roles of germinal centers and memory in vaccine immunology. Dr. Kroti has over 150 high impact publications and was between 2016 and 2019 one of the most cited researchers. His recent, his recent work on COVID-19 has become the highest attention getting cell paper ever. Thank you, Shane, for taking the time to share your work with us today. We are looking forward to your talk. The stage is yours. Thank you, Tamabu. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to do this uh, for the uh, international immunology community. Um, so I'm going to be talking about adaptive immune responses, um, and in particular, immune memory to, to SARS-CoV-2 infections, but also COVID-19 vaccines. Um, I'm gonna talk through uh, several projects um, that we've done here at, at LJI, as well as comment on uh, the, the general state of the field, including some of our uh, uh, work that uh, we recently put out in, in, in preprints and publications. Um, for those of you who, who aren't familiar, so I'm here <clears throat> uh, in California. Uh, La Jolla is right next to San Diego. And we at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology, we're a, a freestanding immunology institute, a nonprofit research institute on the campus of the University of California, San Diego. And COVID, of course, needs no introduction. Um, I find that this, uh, from, from an American perspective or from American situation, um, I should say, uh, this single sentence, I think, uh, really uh, pretty uh, tragically grasps the, the magnitude of um, how extraordinarily bad this pandemic has been. Um, uh, and obviously not for one country, but for uh, all countries. We became involved in COVID-19 research in, in uh, February and March of, of 2020. And almost everything that I'm going to tell you about today has been done in close collaboration with the lab of Alex Seti, who's upstairs from me here at, at LJI. Um, and uh, that resulted in this, uh, in this first uh, paper um, where at the time, um, early on, there was a huge amount of fear and uncertainty regarding this virus. And one of those fears was that uh, people made no immune responses to this virus or that you couldn't protect against this virus. And we thought those things were um, uh, unlikely to be true, but also that formal proof of uh, what kinds of immunity are important against COVID-19, the second bullet point there. Um, that's a very hard thing to prove. And in humans, you know, it might take a long time, maybe 10 years or more to, to fully answer that kind of question. And, and what we realized was that we could get a first guesstimate of what was going on by studying average cases of COVID-19 
and measuring all three branches of adaptive immunity in those cases with the concept that uh, SARS-CoV-2 causes acute infections that resolve or cure in most people. And that that represents a situation where people get infected, they develop a substantial viral load, and then the people generate some sort of immune response that then kills off that viral infection, right? And that immune response that kills off that viral infection will be present shortly after the, the people have, have cleared the infection. And we ask what, what kinds of immunity are there as a first estimate of what kinds of immunity are, are likely to be involved in, in, in control of this virus in some way. Um, it's not a perfect approach because you could have immune responses that are present um, that are generated but don't actually do that much. But it was a, it, it was a, uh, the fastest first approach we could get to. Okay, and we felt that it was important to measure antibody responses um, because those are important in almost all currently licensed. Vaccines, but also CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells as the other two branches of the adaptive immune response. CD4 T cells are critical for antibody responses. Um, that would be by the T follicular helper cells, and and that's uh, as Tamalu mentioned, that's uh, that's an expertise of my lab. And so, um, almost all of the neutralizing antibody responses you will get to um, this virus and, and, and many viruses. Um, are dependent on on T cell help, um, but CD4 T cells can do a, a variety of jobs, not just help B cells, and some of which can be direct antiviral functions, either by Th1 cells or CD4 CTLs. And it had been shown um, in the past that one could uh, get. Let's see. I'll just, I don't know, I'll just go this way that one could get CD4 T cell antiviral functions that were actually protective in a mouse model of, of SARS. And so there were multiple reasons to pay attention to CD4 T cells. Um, and then there are, of course, CD8 T cells, which are important in many viral infections for killing off infected cells. And then an, an oversimplified view of immunology is that antibodies are important for stopping viruses outside of cells, right? And CD8 T cells are important for stopping viruses inside of cells, and, and CD4s um, work in between those. Um, it is certainly more complicated than that, but that's uh, a, a classic first, first estimation of those functions. So when we, to do this, um, <clears throat> we measured responses in 20 individuals, and one of the main challenges with this was to measure the T cell responses because the T cell epitopes um, could be anywhere within the, the proteome of the virus. And that's really the expertise of the, the SETI lab is, is predicting uh, both class two epitopes that CD4 is recognized and class one epitopes that CD8 is recognized in human populations and synthesizing those peptide pools. So they did that and we measured those. And here's the one slide um, summary of that study where we detected antibody responses in 100% of individuals. Let's see. Uh, I'm just gonna see if I could you know, do the, I lost the little pointer control. I was gonna see if I could uh, get that back. Uh, no, can't see it. All right, I'll go without the pointer. Um, uh, go back to this. We detected antibody responses to spike in 100% of individuals, uh, and notably CD4 T cell responses also in 100% of individuals, and CD8s in a majority of individuals. And one of the key features we were interested in with this study was that there were already vaccine studies, um, vaccine development efforts, pardon me, underway, and almost all of those vaccine efforts were exclusively focused on spike And spike made sense because it was the likely target of um, all of the neutralizing antibody responses, which was subsequently shown to be true. Um, but there are many, there are about 25 viral proteins that are possible targets of the T cells. And for some viruses, the spike or spike-like proteins, uh, the envelope proteins, are rather poor targets of T cell responses. And so if, if spike was a poor target of T cell responses, that would be a red flag for spike-only vaccines. And we were very happy to see that 
not only was spike recognized by the CD4s and CD8s, but it was one of the immunodominant targets. And we could uh, see that by, and so this was largely uh, seen as, as good news in the community, that, that, that largely the data we were observing was antiviral immunity that, that matched expectations, okay? And this T cell immunodominance I wanted to show on this slide, if uh, the, the SETI lab synthesized overlapping peptides for the entirety of the SARS-2 genome to really be very thorough about this in addition to the predicted epitopes. And when we do that, what we found was that if we reorganized all of the proteins in order of how highly they are expressed by the virus, we saw that expression level correlated with T cell response magnitude um, and that CD4 T cell responses were recognizing many of the proteins, including, as I mentioned before, S spike as one of the immunodominant targets. And, and so that was positive news for uh, vaccine development, <clears throat> that spike was a good target, um, not only for antibodies, but CD4s and CD8s. Uh, the peptide pools synthesized by, uh, by the SETI lab at LJI um, have been shared widely in the international community, um, uh, in general for free uh, to labs that have had um, appropriate uh, need. And uh, Alex said he's very fond of showing this slide because he's uh, shared these peptides with 142 labs around the world, um, and he's managed to cover six of the seven continents. So. Um, uh, yeah, that's uh, something to be proud of. Um, so now we'll shift to the, the next studies, um, but I want to pause with this, this large and important topic of what are mechanisms of protective immunity against COVID-19? And that's, it, this is still an open topic of research, um, and, and I'm trying to simplify it here in, in three bullet points for the ways I thought about it in, in mid 2020 and still largely think about it. And, and there's a wide range of data supporting these, uh, th these points. So the first is the simplest option for any vaccine development is high level long lasting neutralizing antibodies against a pathogen that is susceptible to neutralizing antibodies. Um, I, I really founded my lab on this principle 18 years ago that that neutralizing antibodies are fantastic in, in vaccines, but that we needed to know better uh, how to generate them. Uh, <clears throat> and specifically in the context of COVID-19, uh, this issue of high level and long lasting neutralizing antibodies is an important one because many labs saw that people who had been infected, uh, who had had COVID-19, had been infected with SARS-CoV-2, uh, did not develop high levels of neutralizing antibodies and it was unclear if they'd be long lasting and same thing with the vaccines. And then now we obviously have all the challenges of variants where neutralizing antibody levels are not necessarily high because of, uh, they're being obviated by variants. And so one of the key motivators for us was Neutralizing antibodies are great, but if you don't have them or don't have high levels, or if they're not long lasting, are there additional layers of defense that can provide you protection, either after infection or after vaccination? And various lines of evidence point to protective contributions of T cells against COVID-19. I'll cover a few of those. Um, and, but the T cells provide protection in other ways than antibodies, and that they're generally not going to prevent you from being infected at all. Um, uh, but that, the third bullet point here is, it, it's reasonable to consider that hospitalization level COVID-19, which is really uh, the biggest issue we face, is prevented by any decent combination of antibodies, memory B cells, CD4s, and, and CD8s. Okay. Uh, and uh, as, as a viral immunologist, I always try to pay attention to the virology when thinking about mechanisms of possible protection. Uh, and for this virus, the, the anatomy and pathogenesis um, are that this is a virus that replicates very quickly in the nasal passages and the oral cavity. Um, and that's where you get in this um, colored bar below the, the range of symptoms to the left, either asymptomatic infection through to um, 
cold and flu-like symptoms. But the disease that we really worry about is the disease of the lungs, and that's where the hospitalization, ICU, and, and fatalities come from. And, and notably, this is a virus that grows very quickly in the nose and mouth, um, but relatively slowly in the lungs, which is noted by um, the, the relatively slow course of disease in the lungs and the relatively long time before people are hospitalized or have severe outcomes compared to how quickly the virus replicates in the nose and mouth and, and transmits. As a result, it's a relatively difficult virus to stop um, in, in the nose and mouth, um, but, but significantly easier to prevent severe outcomes in the lungs because of the kinetics of, of the virus in these different, these different tissues. <clears throat> And in, in thinking about these, um, uh, going to that first bullet point of the importance of antibodies, this is a virus that's clearly susceptible to neutralizing antibodies. Um, antibodies can clearly protect against COVID-19, both in humans and animal models when present before infection, right? So this is clear monoclonal antibody studies, which also demonstrate the value of those antibodies in, in the vaccine. And antibodies are the only mechanism that can provide truly sterilizing immunity because they can literally prevent the infection uh, right in, in the nose and mouth before it even starts. Uh, and there's clear um, outstanding correlation between antibodies and, and protection from symptomatic COVID-19 in, in multiple human vaccine studies, including the um, uh, studies uh, with both Moderna and AstraZeneca vaccines. One of the things to note about antibodies as correlates of protection in those large studies is that antibodies are also a correlate of other adaptive immune responses. Um, antibodies are, are clearly a correlate of CD4 T cells because these neutralizing antibodies are almost always dependent on the CD4 T cells. Thus, in, in most situations, right, antibodies are a surrogate marker of vaccine-specific CD4s, at least T follicular helper cells, because those are the ones that help the B cells. Um, <clears throat> And there's evidence for that in, in COVID-19 uh, as well, and I'll, I'll briefly mention some of that. Um, the second point uh, is, uh, is there also evidence of protective contributions of, of T cells? T cells are intrinsically much more challenging to study than, than antibodies, and you also don't have the simple burden of proof with antibodies of doing a passive transfer, like the monoclonal antibody experiment in, in humans or, or non-human primates. Um, still, there's a wide variety of data supporting protective contributions of T cells, um, particularly against, again, later stages uh, or more severe stages of, of disease. I'm not summarizing it all here, um, but I did uh, try to summarize this in, in two reviews that have been submitted to immunological reviews, one on uh, protective immunity and the other on uh, immune memory. And, and those have been posted as, as preprints at the, at the DOI shown, shown below. Um, some of these data are bullet pointed here. Um, T cell responses have correlated with better outcomes and lower viral loads in SARS-CoV-2 infections. Some of the most direct data has really come from monkeys and, and studies from uh, Dan Baruch and colleagues uh, showing that if you deplete CD8 T cells, that has an impact on control. And, and to me, some of the, the clearest human data has actually come from the monoclonal antibody clinical trials, where those monoclonal antibodies, when given early in an outpatient setting, do have clear clinical benefit at reducing the likelihood of uh, hospitalization. Um, but notably, they have quite modest impacts on viral loads. Viral loads are only down about threefold after seven days compared to people who um, did not get the monoclonal antibody treatment. Even though these monoclonal antibodies give people neutralizing antibody titers something like a thousand fold higher than what they would normally generate on their own, which uh, uh, I think suggests that uh, T cells are probably playing a big role in controlling viral loads in, in people who are already infected. Um, I'm going to skip uh, some of the others in the interest of time, but, but you can see them there on the slide. Uh, work from our own lab um, has, has contributed to this topic uh, in this study, 
where we tried to ask, as we did in our, in our first study, uh, what does it look like when we measure virus-specific uh, CD4 T cells, CD8 T cells, and antibodies in the same people at the same time? But in this study, we now did so both in hospitalized and non-hospitalized people, including trying to get data while people were currently infected and ask, uh, did any adaptive immune responses correlate with better or worse outcomes in, in, in this cohort of about um, 50 individuals? Uh, and what we found summarized here in a single slide was that um, <clears throat> If we looked at the CTL, the CD8s, the TH, the CD4s, and the antibodies shown in that, uh, in that schematic in the middle and on the right, um, people who developed all three of those responses generally had better outcomes than people who had failures to generate one or more of those immune responses, i.e. if someone did not have a detectable CD8 or CD4 response, that person was more likely to end up uh, with more severe disease. And statistically, you can see in the, uh, I'm summarizing it with those two asterisks, asterisks, um, both CD8 T cell responses and CD4 T cell responses were statistically associated with better outcomes, whereas the, an the antibody titers were not associated um, with better outcomes. And um, the antibody stories are, are complicated, um, but in general, statistically, right, um, higher neutralizing antibody titers have been correlated with, uh, with worse outcomes, suggesting that those high titers are, are predominantly correlating with, with more viral burden, whereas what we observed was that T cells are actually going the opposite direction and, and correlating with better outcomes. And one of the interesting observations from that study was that those outcomes correlated with age. And in that second bullet point, um, we said, you know, a parsimonious model of all these data, a somewhat speculative model, but a parsimonious model, is that if, since T cells were correlating with better outcomes, what, what we, what's well known in people as they age is that people over the age of 65 frequently have uh, significantly smaller populations of naive T cells in their blood. And when you are infected with a new viral infection, it is those naive T cells that are the ones that have to recognize that virus in general and control the infection. And so a simple model would be that older people, particularly older people who happen to have smaller pools of naive T cells, are at higher risk of making a slower and smaller T cell response to the virus and thereby not control the virus fast enough and end up hospitalized as, as a result. That is a working model that is consistent with the data that we have, it certainly was not proven um, in this study. And I just want to note uh, the three uh, leads of, of that very challenging study were, were Carolyn Motobacher, um, a postdoc in the lab who ran all the, the T cell work and, and is currently interviewing for faculty positions. Sydney Ramirez, who's an infectious disease fellow who is critical for recruiting all the hospitalized patients, which was a big uh, a big challenge, and then Assistant Professor Jennifer Dan at, at UCSD, who uh, was responsible for all of the, the serological assays. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so with those data and ideas in mind, um, now by the fall of 2020, uh, there was now lots of fear that people did not remember this coronavirus infection, their immune system did not remember this coronavirus infection, and therefore there would be no protection against reinfection because there was a lack of immune memory against this coronavirus and maybe other coronaviruses. Um, with all that, that fear, um, we decided to directly study immune memory uh, to SARS-CoV-2. And, and this is an important uh, topic in, in general, uh, both for this virus and, and other viruses about uh, does immune memory get generated and how long does it, does it last? And we followed the same philosophy we did with our earlier studies of it being important to measure all the major components of adaptive virus-specific immune responses in the same people at the same time 
to see how they were related. And thus, we measured antibodies, memory CD4s, and memory CD8s, but now we also measured memory B cells. Uh, memory B cells are, um, so plasma cells are the cells that are actively making antibodies. Memory B cells are uh, really uh, antibody factories with the lights turned off, right? So memory B cells are capable of making more neutralizing antibodies and non-neutralizing antibodies, but they're not actively doing so. They're, they're waiting for uh, a new viral exposure. So did people make these memory, memory cells after uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection? Um, in this study, again, in close collaboration with the SETI lab, we uh, enrolled 188 people, which was the, the largest study ever um, of its kind for any acute infection, to actually look at all four of these components of antigen-specific memory. Um, uh, I'll note that in general in this study, we did not have many um, asymptomatic individuals because we really wanted to make sure that the people we were including had, had definitely been infected and because of availability of testing and whatnot, the, the clearest way to do that was, was symptomatic. And the other main tenet of, of our um, approach is shown in the very bottom line there, um, where uh, I trained in Rafi Ahmed's lab, um, uh, who's, who's been interested in immunological memory for decades, and, and many of us who've worked in his lab and, and he himself have found that it's very difficult to predict immune memory at the time of infection or shortly thereafter. And, and that we felt like we were most likely to get the, the best understanding of the kinetics of immune memory if we waited at least six months post-infection. And you'll see from the data that that was a good philosophy to, to follow. And indeed, in the end, we had eight months of data. Okay, so what did that look like? Um, I'm just gonna show a single, single slide summary of the data. There's a lot of data in the study. It was a massive effort by um, by many people in, in my lab and Alex Sede's group. Here I'm showing you neutralizing antibody titers, memory B cells, CD8 T cells, and CD4 T cells for all of these 188 individuals over the course of eight months uh, uh, post-infection or more specifically post-symptom onset PSO. And we fit each of these data to the simplest curves that, that explain the majority of the data. The neutralizing antibody data in the upper left um, and are consistent with much larger serological studies than ours. That after infection, there is a decline in neutralizing antibody titers, but it stabilizes approximately four to six months uh, post-infection. And, and other studies have now seen that these neutralizing antibody titers are low, but stable um, 18 months uh, post-infection. And I summarize that in my uh, immune memory review that I, I recently posted online. Strikingly below that, you can see the memory B cell data, and we observed that actually there are more spike-specific memory B cells at four months post-infection than there are at one month post-infection, and that was a, a striking observation. The, the memory B cells are actually going the opposite direction of the circulating antibodies, and we saw this both, we saw this with spike-specific, um, RBD-specific, and with nucleocapsid, and this has been reproduced in, in multiple labs at this point. We also don't think this is unique to this viral infection. Um, it was just the first time we'd seen it because it was uh, such a large study. <clears throat> now on the right side, we can see the T cells. Uh, the, the virus specific CD8 T cells were detectable in about 70% of individuals at early time points around day 30, and about 50% of people at six to eight months post-infection. Um, so I do think it's notable that we're not detecting virus-specific CD8s in 100% of individuals. And it's unclear why um, a, a fraction of people had no detectable CD8s at early time points. Um, I think that's biologically relevant. But amongst the people who made CD8 T cell responses, um, the, the half-life we calculated was about 125 days. And the benchmark for CD8 T cell memory is the yellow fever virus vaccine actually established by Rafi Ahmed and colleagues. And that's an outstanding vaccine with very long lasting CD8 T cells. And the early decay of memory CD8 T cells um, against the yellow fever vaccine is a half-life almost identical to what we found for COVID-19 uh, 
about 120 days or so. And so we expect that this first six months or so is probably the period of the most rapid decline in the T cells, and then the T cells are more likely to plateau or at least slow their decline after that. And so uh, we think this indicates that there is quite good CD8 T cell memory generated uh, after infection in the people who do generate a detectable response. Below that is the CD4 T cell memory. CD4 T cell memory is much more robust than CD8 T cell memory against this virus, with almost 100% of people being positive and something like 90% of people still being positive out um, at six to eight months, and with a half-life fairly similar to the CD8s. Um, there actually wasn't another study to compare this to at the time, so this is actually now um, a, a really a reference data set for comparing other acute viral infections to Within those CD4 T cells, we certainly saw TFH cells and, and TH1 cells, which are the dominant cell types we would expect to see in response to a viral infection. Um, so overall, that really looks like rather good immune memory to, uh, to this infection. But there's a lot of heterogeneity and diversity from person to person. And so we felt it was important to try and capture that information and, and attempt to extrapolate what it might mean for protective immunity. We, and so we took, of the many parameters we measured, we took the five that we thought were most likely, that were both diverse and were most likely to contribute in some way to protective immunity. Again, when I say protective immunity, I mean protection against severe outcomes. Um, and then ask of those five, how many of those five memory components did each person in the study have? And you can see that, um, conceptual schematic on the uh, on the right. And so when we did that, here's what it looked like. At one month post-infection, most individuals had all five of these memory components. And out at six months, which is what we're, we're more interested in, because six months from the data I was showing you before, looks like it's probably representative of what the immune memory is going to look like for these people for years into the future. And what we see is um, as summarized at the bottom, about 95% of people who'd been infected um, still were positive for at least three out of five immune memory components out at six months uh, that we think would be relevant for protective immunity. And so to us, that suggests um, both that there's going to be uh, durability uh, and that most of these individuals would be protected from uh, from uh, reinfection or significant reinfection. And now many epidemiological studies, uh, which are really the direct evidence, right, of protection, this is direct measurement of the immune memory that would be relevant for the protection, but not any direct demonstration of protection. But epidemiological studies have really um, supported that, that conclusion that people with previous infections um, have a high degree of protection from reinfection and certainly from, from severe outcomes, at least all the way through, uh, through Omicron. And now even with Omicron, where people uh, previously infected people really have uh, essentially no neutralizing antibodies against Omicron, they still have um, a high degree of protection against uh, severe outcomes with, with Omicron, um, consistent with these measurements. We then moved to do similar studies in the context of vaccines. Um, and the, the dominant vaccines used here in the United States are the RNA vaccines, uh, the, the, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And so we wanted to study immune memory to these vaccines. Clearly these RNA vaccines have been uh, exceptionally successful in short-term protection and in generating very strong neutralizing antibodies, at least for a period of months. And what we wanted to know was um, these RNA vaccines are new technology. Uh, do they generate T cell memory or not? That was an unknown. And so this paper uh, published in, in Science uh, a few months back was the first demonstration of, uh, of T cell memory to these vaccines at, at six months uh, post-vaccination. And in this particular study, summarized in this slide, we were making use of samples from a low-dose Moderna clinical trial. And we we had access to this clinical trial and we were keen on it because it had blood samples from people before vaccination and after vaccination, which I'll come back to. Um, but this was a Moderna dose that's actually pretty equivalent to the Pfizer dose, so uh, 25 micrograms. And so we think this is sort of the, um, it's the Moderna vaccine, but used at a Pfizer dose, so probably pretty reflective of, of the Pfizer vaccine. And we'll come back to that 
in our more recent data. And what we saw was that um, after two doses of vaccine, that's where the peak of the antibodies are in that antibody graph, uh, the antibodies then declined seven to tenfold over the next six months. Um, and multiple groups have shown, many groups have shown that at this point. So our data was consistent with that. But when we look at T cell memory in the same individuals, there's only a two-fold decline from peak of CD4 T cells out at six months uh, after the second vaccination, so out at seven months after the first vaccination. And CD8 T cells um, are actually generated to this vaccine in about 80% of individuals, and of the people who do have detectable responses, there's only a two-fold decline in those responses six months later. Uh, and when we then compared those responses to natural immunity, to people who had been infected, looking again at six months post-infection and looking at responses to spike antibody CD4 and CD8. And uh, the vaccine response, the low-dose Moderna vaccine responses, the memory was actually equivalent to the memory magnitude seen after infection for each of these three, specifically looking at spike. Obviously, after infection, there's more than just spike that's recognized. Overall, we thought that was very impressive uh, to see that the RNA vaccines did that well at generating both CD4 and CD8 memory. Not perfect, but quite well. And those kinetics suggest that, that people were likely to have memory for uh, a long time into the future. <clears throat> we also looked at age and saw there was really no impact of age on the T cell responses, which was also uh, quite encouraging. And then finally, um, we were interested in the impact of, of pre-existing T cells. And this is because back in that first COVID-19 study that we did, we looked not only in infected individuals, but we looked in uninfected individuals. And we used blood samples that the SETI lab had collected between 2015 and 2018. So we know these people had no exposure to SARS-CoV-2. And nevertheless, you can see for the CD4 T cells, about 50% of people had detectable memory CD4 T cells that were reactive against SARS-CoV-2. That was surprising that there was that much cross-reactivity in these people. And what we speculated was that um, approximately half of the population made cross-reactive T cells from previous common cold coronavirus infections or other viral infections that could somehow cross-recognize SARS-CoV-2. And then Many labs have now reproduced this on many continents. Um, and, you know, what we said the key questions were, are these cells biologically relevant? The fact that we can measure them in vitro in a laboratory dish means that they are detectable, but are they functional enough to be helpful in the context of SARS-CoV-2? Or is the cross-reactivity too low to be biologically meaningful? Or is it even, it's even possible that it could be bad in some way? And so we spent a lot of effort trying to deal with that. And um, we, we decided that the, the best study to address this was actually a vaccine study where we could collect blood samples from everybody immediately before vaccination um, and then ask after vaccination, splitting people into two groups, people who had cross-reactive T cell memory, people who didn't have cross-reactive T cell memory, what were their responses to the vaccine? Did the cross-reactive T cells actually improve responses to the vaccine? Did they do nothing or did they impair responses to the vaccine? And what you can see in that far column summary was that actually people who had pre-existing cross-reactive T cell memory actually had bigger antibody responses to the vaccine and bigger CD4 T cell responses to the vaccine, thus demonstrating a biological relevance of these cross-reactive memory T cells. Um, and this work was led by Assistant Professor Daniela Weisskopf here at LJI, along with myself and, uh, and, and Alex Sete. Um, and uh, when this work was published, it was published back to back um, with, with study by the Thiels and colleagues in, in Germany who had made similar findings for the Pfizer vaccine. So this was not um, only a single observation. And that really set the stage for this third bullet point shown in this slide, which is work that, that I'm not involved in at all, but I think is fantastically interesting by many colleagues who in looking at a healthcare worker, HCW, healthcare worker cohort in the UK during the first wave, uh, they asked the question, why were there healthcare workers who were highly exposed to the virus who nevertheless um, did not get 
showed no signs of infection. And what they found in a series of correlative analyses, they didn't have blood samples from before, um, they just had blood samples afterwards, but in a series of correlative analyses that I found compelling, um, summarized in the graph on the right, healthcare workers who had evidence of cross-reactive memory T cells, pre-existing cross-reactive T cells against SARS-CoV-2, were significantly more likely to remain seronegative uh, against SARS-CoV-2 even after multiple exposures. And, and a number of these people actually had some biomarker evidence of uh, active infections, um, but uh, apparently quite small infections. So the the, the simplest but most but quite striking interpretation of the data is that these individuals had T cells that somehow recognized the virus so fast and cleared the infection so fast, these people never seroconverted um, or in fact became detectable, uh, became positive by a viral test. Um, and I'll come back to that a bit uh, in, in a minute, okay, this, this topic. I think there are, it is a correlative study, there are other interpretations, but I'm gonna come uh, uh, talk about it a little bit more um, right after this study. So this is our most recent study um, where in continuing to be focused on immune memory, there are really extraordinary opportunities uh, with COVID vaccines to better understand vaccine immunology and immune memory to different vaccines because there are so many different successful vaccines in use right now um, that one can actually compare these different vaccines head to head. And these vaccines generally weren't compared head to head in, in clinical trials. Um, but we could obtain uh, samples from volunteers in the local California community and uh, ask people who got vaccinated with four different vaccines that we had access to. The Moderna vaccine, mRNA-1273, um, which you can see summarized in the table, the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, the Janssen uh, J&J AD26, the adenoviral vector vaccine, um, similar to the AstraZeneca vaccine, and then the Novavax vaccine. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with the Novavax vaccine, that's a protein vaccine, recombinant spike protein with an adjuvant. And so we're, we could we set out to study four different successful COVID vaccines. So the the Moderna vaccine had what 95% protection in clinical trials. The Pfizer vaccine had uh, mid 90s as well. The Janssen vaccine had mid 70s, and then the uh, <clears throat> uh, Novavax vaccine in phase three clinical trials had 90% uh, protection um, in in the short term. So and considering uh, those very successful vaccines, we could then compare, we, we set out to compare four different vaccines, but actually there are four different vaccines that represent three different vaccine technologies. So how do these different vaccine technologies compare in terms of immune memory? Um, and we've posted this as a preprint, and we again did this as an extensive study involving binding antibodies, neutralizing antibodies, uh, multiple types of CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells and memory B cells. And in brief, um, uh, in work done by Zeli Zhang and Jen Dan, um, we showed that, that antibodies are quite high after two doses of Moderna or Pfizer and then decline substantially over the next six months. T5 is six months. The adenoviral vector actually had very low neutralizing antibodies, but interestingly, in many people, it went up some over time. So the opposite pattern of the RNA vaccine. Whereas the Novavax vaccine shown on the right in purple, the dark colored line is the median of all the individuals in our study. Had substantial antibody titers that looked relatively stable. Uh, and each of these compared um, to infection. Infection is shown in yellow on, on the right. Uh, uh, <clears throat> we then looked at CD4 memory and we could see uh, the RNA vaccines generated very good CD4 memory as measured by uh, AIM assay, total CD4s, or cytokine secreting assays shown here. And the CD4 T cell memory looked relatively stable at its six months post-infection. And lower CD4 memory to the add vector, but um, 
stable over time. And to Novavax, also looking uh, approximately stable at its six months post-infection with uh, magnitude of CD4s that were actually comparable to that of the Pfizer vaccine. Um, T follicular helper responses were good to all of them, um, and T they all made TFH memory. So there is TFH memory to these vaccines. CD8 responses, you can see percent responders above both to Moderna and Pfizer. There was a substantial percent of responders and fairly stable memory. Um, and in fact, it compared favorably to the adenoviral vector. Um, and uh, memory B cells, uh, led by Camilla Coelho, an instructor in the lab, were most robust for the RNA vaccines, interestingly, with evidence of increase between three months and six months, consistent with what we saw also after infection and consistent with what other labs are seeing, and significantly more than Janssen and Janssen or J and J. Um, uh, and so, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to briefly mention two more things, and then we'll go to the Q&A. Um, obviously, variants are very important. Um, uh, in work led by Alba Grifoni uh, and, and the SETI lab, uh, we worked hard over the holidays to ask if T cell recognition by these vaccines is maintained to Omicron. And so the top row is CD4s, the bottom row is CD8s, and this is showing a whole series of different variants, including Omicron and Brown on the right, and both recognition by CD4s and CD8s um, to multiple vaccines is, is highly conserved, um, uh, even to viruses as divergent as Omicron, uh, consistent with T cells recognizing the virus in a different way than, uh, than antibodies, and also that the vaccines are eliciting fairly diverse T cell responses to these vaccines. Uh, lastly, um, I talked about the anatomy of adaptive immunity, and I also talked about um, some evidence of T-cell control. Well, uh, vaccines generate circulating T-cells, uh, but they'll have to do their job in the nose or mouth or throat, and so that'll take time for them to get there. Um, really what you want is layered defenses, um, not just antibodies, but other things, and we've shown, if you can look on the right, circulating. The vaccines are clearly generating neutralizing antibodies, memory CD4s, memory CD8s, and memory B cells. And by having multiple layers of defense, the vaccines are more likely to prevent severe COVID-19. Um, I think that's the most likely interpretation of the available data. It is possible that neutralizing antibodies are doing almost everything in the protection, but um, as I said, uh, there's a good deal of data supporting that uh, T cells are also contributing. But then, we wonder if tissue resident memory cells could also contribute. And that's what we can see in uh, this study with Donna Farber, where by studying organ donors, um, we looked at multiple different tissues of people who had had a previous COVID-19 uh, infection, but unremarkable, not hospitalized. And what we saw is that this infection does generate lung tissue resident CD4s and CD8s shown by Donna Farber's lab and it generates lung resident memory B cells um, as shown in my lab. And so this is a viral infection that can generate tissue resident memory cells and the presence of those tissue resident memory T cells and B cells is probably contributing to protection um, against reinfection and is one of the reasons that people who have you know, apparently relatively low neutralizing antibody levels post-infection still have a significant degree of protection. So I tried to thank most everybody along the way. I do wanna highlight Jose Mateus down there in the middle, who did fantastic T cell work on a whole series of these studies. And then in Donna Farber's lab, it was Maya Poon and Zinnia uh, Ripkina who did the TRM work. Um, and so uh, Tomabu, I will stop there and we can do questions. Thank you, Shane, for the wonderful presentation. I'm really impressed by the amount of data. Uh, and so are the participants as well. We have a lot of questions. But I will start with uh, a question as uh, an African. I am very curious about your comments on the low incidence we have on COVID-19 in Africa. Do you think that this is due to uh, the presence of cross-reactive memory T cells, or is there anything else that can explain this low incidence in Africa? Yeah, it's a great question and an important question. 
Um, I think in countries around the world where there has been there have been reports of of low incidence, I think mostly that low incidence has been the result of uh, not much testing being available essentially. And when people have gone back and done uh, zero surveys, they they've seen that there has actually been a lot of infection going on, and it just hasn't been diagnosed. And, and certainly one of the key things about um, populations in multiple African countries um, compared to, let's say, for example, the United States, is there's a much older population in the U.S. than in Africa. And so you're, um, since there is such a dramatic age effect of disease severity with COVID-19, you're more likely to see those more severe outcomes and hospitalizations in, in older populations. I definitely think there are um, uh, cross-reactive T cells in, um, in most uh, African populations. And I think Wendy Berger in South Africa um, has the, the clearest publication showing that. Um, I haven't seen any evidence for dramatic differences in cross-reactive T cells between different populations that they that they're there um, but not dramatically different but it's a fascinating idea yeah it could be something to investigate next so we have a question from juan francisco delgado hope i pronounced the name well he's asking what what antibodies teeters in bau per meal, binding activity units, are considered protective for SARS-CoV-2 infection? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and uh, that's a reason that we, in all of our studies now, we measure antibodies in international units um, per meal. And the, um, really the best data there are from the uh, Moderna Correlates of Protection study and the AstraZeneca correlates of protection study um, showing, and it, it depends on the number that you're interested in, right? Is it 50% protection or is it 90% protection? And notably, those units are all for the ancestral strain, um, not for uh, Omicron or, or, or Delta, but it was in the, uh, and it depends on what do you mean by protection, protection from infection or protection from severe disease. And so protection against infection, it was in the um, couple hundred units range against ancestral, uh, but uh, it, it was extrapolated in other studies that uh, essentially signals right around the limit of detection initially would be sufficient to correlate with uh, protection against hospitalization. And again, that correlation might be um, all antibody, but it's probably a correlation showing that as long as people made a detectable antibody response, that meant that they were likely to have also made, um, even though that those antibodies might be low, they've also made some level of a T cell response. Um, and we do some of those correlations in our preprint. What's, what's the relationship between antibody titers and CD4s and CD8s. Um, and there are uh, some correlations, but not great quantitative correlations, uh, which I think is consistent with um, uh, the conclusions made in the correlate studies. Okay. Thank you very much. We have, uh, I have a follow-up question actually on, on that one. Um, yeah. What, what do you think could be the role of innate immunity in the protection against and SARS-CoV-2 infections? Because we discuss a lot about adaptive immunity and a lot of things going on uh, at an adaptive level, but how can or could innate immunity be sufficient to avoid contamination? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think innate immunity is incredibly important in SARS-CoV-2 infections. It's just my lab studies adaptive immunity and immune memory and vaccines, right? So that's what we work on and that's what we measure. But in the, in the review that I wrote, uh, adaptive immunity to COVID-19 uh, last year, um, I said, look, the, the data I think are really clear that innate immunity is important and it's important in at least a couple of ways. The, to me, the clear evidence that innate immunity is important is that 
any virus that can cause disease in humans has to have at least one good immune evasion trick. If it couldn't evade the immune system at all, it couldn't cause disease. And it doesn't mean that a virus has only one, but it's it's valuable to to, to focus on you know what's important about the virus. And and for this virus, it's sort of it's one trick or its superpower, if you will, is that it's incredibly good at evading innate immunity innate immunity early on. And that's why you have asymptomatic transmission, right? You have people going four, five, six days with high viral loads, and they don't even know that they're infected because their innate immune system hasn't been triggered. The virus has been doing an incredibly good job of avoiding setting off those innate immune right, fire alarms. And that uh, the genetic studies that have been done have found that you know people who have poor type one interferon responses, right, for a couple of different reasons, are at incredible risk for severe fatal outcomes. And that uh, GWAS studies have also seen that, that key genes and innate immune pathways are, are important for uh, protection or susceptibility against this virus. Because you can imagine if you had just somewhat better triggering of innate immune responses, right? Um, it, it looks like you can control this virus better, which may also play into the vaccines, actually. I think you can have these feedback loops between adaptive and innate immunity, right? So if you have a vaccine where you have some adaptive immunity, as soon as the virus shows up, even though it's good at evading innate, if you have adaptive to start triggering stuff, that can trigger um, local innate immunity. Um, and then I think innate immunity is very effective against this virus if it gets activated early enough. Yeah. yeah great question. Thank and an you. important topic. Go ahead. Um, we have Mohammad Nasnamazi who is asking as both branches of human immunity are essential for successful protection, how demonstrate that antibody dependent and T cell response could be merged true vaccine production? Yeah, it's a great question and it's important for uh, many diseases and many, many vaccines. Um, they are hard problems. They are, uh, one can definitely address those in, in mouse models where you can directly manipulate CD4, CD8s and antibodies. And in models like that in studying pox viruses like uh, vaccinia virus, which is the smallpox vaccine, you can show um, that if you remove any one of those three, right, or you just add one of those three, you can generally observe that any two out of three of those components of the immune system is very good at controlling that viral infection, i.e. you can do well with just CD4s and CD8s or just antibodies and CD4s or just antibodies and CD8s, but any one of them alone isn't, isn't that good. And so you'd yeah. love to have COVID studies like that the challenge has been that most of the mouse models are so fast in terms of disease progression and death, they don't really reflect what, what T cells um, are contributing in humans where there's more time for the T cells to respond. So currently we're depending on um, mostly uh, monkey model data where people are can deplete CD8s or deplete CD4s and look to see if they have a beneficial effect. And that was some of the data that I referred to. In terms of vaccine design, um, that comes back to some of that data I was showing from the preprints. W what are these different vaccine technologies actually capable of doing, right? And if you are, really want a strong CD8 T cell response, for example, which one of these platforms um, does the best uh, at that or do multiple platforms do well at that? And so I think those are the types of data it's important to look at when designing future vaccines. Okay. Uh, now, Sylvia Knapp is asking, you show that T, the T cell response to Moderna does not change with age. Huh. Yeah. That the, I'm not sure to read it properly, that's why I show it so that you can read. That yeah, that is a pool of nine T cells cannot explain differences in disease the severity? That is a great question, Sylvia. Um, and, uh, uh, and I do talk about that in, in several of those papers and the review we wrote last year. Essentially, uh, it's all about kinetics. Uh, and so the, the results that we were seeing that 
older individuals seem to be struggling with infection or be at higher risk of severe disease in part because of smaller T cell uh, pools and maybe a slower T cell response. That's actually very good news for vaccines because the whole value, one of the, well, yeah, the whole value of a vaccine is you are getting to make the immune response on your own time <laughs> instead of in a race with the virus, right? You're not, you're not infected. And so um, uh, the vaccine can trigger those T cells and yes, there are fewer of them, but they can then expand massively and it turns out expand up to the same levels that you'll see in, in people who had you know, larger pools or approximately. So it's a, it's a time thing, right? So I think if we looked at day six post-vaccination, some younger individuals would have detectable T cell responses, but older individuals wouldn't. But instead we're looking later um, and, and by those later time points, day 14, day 30, there's been enough time and two doses of vaccine, right? You get two chances. One of the reasons you go with multiple doses of a vaccine is to bring everybody up to a comparable level. Uh, and so there, uh, what we were certainly concerned about was that whether older individuals are just fundamentally unable to expand the T cells that much. And that hasn't turned out to be the case, which is, which is good. So I, I do think that they have frequently have smaller pools of naive T cells, but those T cells are still capable of, of uh, excellent expansion. So yeah, great question, Sylvia. Thank you for asking that. Thank you, Sylvia, for the question. Um, we okay, have... then maybe we can do one more, but then I gotta, I gotta go to my next yeah, event. Uh, let me try to find one interesting one. You've been choosing time. great, Tamabu. You've okay. been choosing great. So I, I have faith really, in you. <laughs> really all questions are really interesting, but um, we cannot answer all questions. That's why we need to choose the best one. So we have this question from Shuba. Uh, she put, sorry for pronouncing, uh, for the, my pronunciation of the name. Will multiple doses booster or miss the vaccine cause immune exhaustion? What's yeah, it? that's a fantastic question. Um, I write about this in the immune memory preprint um, mm -hmm. that I've got posted. So if you if you caught that link, um, uh, it, it's it's there. So um, there are several things about boosters. Uh, well, so the short answer is. Um, I'm not worried about exhaustion with the boosters and particularly boosters that are six months to a year apart. Uh, uh, one of the things that I think shown most impressively by the Nuisance Flag Lab for COVID-19 and what we've been seeing in HIV vaccine studies in a, in a preprint we've got out is that, uh, and that we showed for COVID-19 infections as well, that, that germinal center responses can go on for six months or more. And Ali Ali Betty has shown this with the RNA vaccines and that the memory B cells that come out of those germinal centers being driven by the T follicular helper cells, they're getting better and better over time. And one of the amazing things about these vaccines, at least the, the RNA vaccines has been that people can make neutralizing antibodies against Omicron, even though they were vaccinated with a vaccine that definitely does not contain Omicron, right? Omicron looks a lot different than the ancestral, but people who have gotten two doses of RNA vaccine or people who have been previously infected have memory B cells that are capable of recognizing Omicron, even if they aren't making neutralizing antibodies there. And that's because one of the points of germinal centers is to make essentially a library of memory responses that can recognize variants. And so then when you get that third vaccination, now you make neutralizing antibodies against Omicron. And the reason I say that is that uh, the more time you have between those immunizations, it looks like the better that memory is going to be, okay? The more diverse those memory B cells, the better able to recognize variants like Omicron. Uh, you want to be patient and give those responses time, even though it's months since your previous infection, uh, previous vaccination. And certainly for T cells, T cells, you want at least a month between exposures for them to rest and develop high quality memory. So I think boosters at least six months apart are going to be um, okay. A question of when do you need a booster, right? Most of those decisions should be made about when do you need boosters. And I definitely think it's, it's 
uh, right to say that people who are at high risk of severe disease, right, certainly people over the age of 65, Omicron is, is quite a different looking virus. This is a virus that's much more infectious than, than the original virus. And so, yeah, having, you know, having third and fourth doses really is valuable for those high, uh, high risk individuals. Um, for everybody else, I think it's much more up in the air. I think, I think most of the protective immunity that you get is from the, the earlier doses. So fantastic question. Uh, we could talk about that for a whole additional hour, but we won't. <laughs> Thank you very much for the nice presentation and the wonderful Q&A. And sorry for all questions we could not answer, but maybe we'll have a little occasion to come back to this. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Tamabu. Thanks to everybody for joining. All right.